One day, I believe that everybody in this very room will have the power to cure incurable disease from the comfort of your very own living room. In fact, I believe that we are on the cusp of a revolution in bioinformatics, a revolution in which anybody, regardless of your past experience, will be able to create powerful computer models. Using only a few clicks on your keyboard, you'll create computer models that can find cures for disease that have troubled us for a very long time. In fact, I believe we're on the edge of eradicating disease for the first time in human history. And I think many of you are skeptical from what I'm judging. Like you're wondering, well, how is this possible? Lawrence, you're just talking about a, some sort of pipe dream. Well, the basis for this revolution is based on this. This cute guy over here is an image of collagen, which is a protein. Proteins are really the fundamental building blocks of life as we know it. In fact, in the example of collagen, its specific structure, its helixes and its strands allow it to make up our blood vessels. And if you were to tweak the structures of proteins by just a little bit, stretching it, curving it, elongating it, you create proteins that are very different, that have very specific functions. In fact, at this very moment, there are over 80,000 different types of proteins in each and every one of our bodies simultaneously communicating with each other, forming these very complex networks that sustain life as we know it. However, these networks are sadly vulnerable to failure. And when failure happens, it manifests itself as disease. The first type of failure happens when you have external agents that attack our human bodies. Let's look at an example. In the early 20th century, the polio virus is causing ravages across the world, resulting in over thousands of new cases every single year. To solve this problem, researchers developed a vaccine, a technology which, in this current day and age, we are all very, very familiar with. In the case of the polio virus, researchers uh, created a dead virus and injected it into our bloodstream. As a result, our body's immune system, our natural defenses, were able to synthesize uh, new antibodies, new generated proteins that could prevent future infections. As a result, you can see that the dead virus itself is basically a bundle of a bunch of proteins and just shows to what point proteins are crucial to curing disease. The other type of disease is internal. It happens when our own bodily mechanisms malfunction. A very obvious case would be cancer. One of the most promising treatments for cancer nowadays is immunotherapy. Immunotherapy happens when you program your white blood cells, basically your body's natural defenses, to identify and kill these malignant cancer cells. You can do so by synthesizing specific proteins that can activate a very specific pathway in order to identify and kill these cancer cells. These two different treatments, one for an external disease and the other one for an internal disease, both rely on proteins, and these two are reflective of the thousands of treatments available today to cure a variety of disease. As promising as this is, these treatments have the limitations. In fact, they're very lengthy and very costly to develop. It took 23 years to develop the first polio vaccine, from research and development to clinical trials and finally mass production. It took 16 years to develop Yervoy, which is a treatment for immunotherapy. I believe that in this coming revolution, we can drastically reduce this development phase to only a matter of hours. This is how. There are three key sectors that have exponentially evolved in the last few decades, which make this possible. The first key sector is an exponential increase in the quantity of medical data. In fact, it's becoming cheaper than ever to read and sequence biomedical data of all sorts. Here's an example. In the year 2003, Researchers first successfully read the, complete, the first complete human genome. It only cost $3 billion and 13 years of development. In contrast, two decades later, there are commercial companies that can do the exact same task for only $300 and in less than a day. This increase in medical data has been very evident. In fact, medical data has increased more than tenfold in just the past decade. This provides researchers and basically anyone with a true trove of hidden gems of data that can allow us to really dig, dig much deeper and discover new insights about how diseases evolve and how our body functions on a most basic level. 
But data is useless if you don't have the means to analyze it. But this is now possible thanks to new developments in artificial intelligence. There have been countless contributions of AI into biomedical research, but I think one example stands, above, stands out above all the rest. The case to solve the problem of protein folding. So proteins happen to fold in very complex and mysterious ways, and if you can predict how proteins fold, well, basically, you can design any macromolecule, any protein, to cure basically any disease. Every two years, there is a competition called CASP, where researchers from around the world try to develop models that can predict how these proteins fold. And progress has been very stagnant. You see, it's quite complex, and the best accuracies were usually between 30 to 50 percent. But all of this changed in 2018, when DeepMind, Google's AI research division, developed a model called AlphaFold, which relies on a specific form of AI called deep learning. Essentially, they produced breakthrough results with an accuracy that was around 50%, which was unprecedented. But it doesn't stop here. Two years later, DeepMind returned, and DeepMind released AlphaFold 2, an augmented version that has nearly 90% accuracy in predicting protein structures. And by the way, this accuracy is on par with experimental results in the laboratories. And this progress is only expected to continue as artificial intelligence is developing more and more accurate simulations of life on its most basic level. Now, you might be wondering, well, just how accessible is artificial intelligence to the everyday person? And it turns out, it's pretty accessible. Two of the most popular machine learning libraries, TensorFlow and PyTorch, were released in 2015 and 2016. And their usage has rapidly increased in the years that follow. In fact, in 2021, about one programmer in six has some experience with a machine learning library. And in fact, you don't even need to learn how to code in order to work with artificial intelligence. Right now, there are many companies and cloud services that allow you to run AI models on the cloud for free at no cost without writing any code. So to summarize, we have the data and we have the tools to analyze the data. How can we actually manufacture these ideas into actual products? Well, this is possible thanks to sharp decreases in the cost of bioengineering, of engineering life on its molecular scale. Bioengineering costs have decreased sharply over the last few decades. Let's look at the example of gene synthesis. Genes act as the blueprint of all life. They encode protein structures, and they also encode how these proteins are expressed but it's rather costly to synthesize new genes. In fact, in the year 2000, when the human genome was being sequenced, it cost $10 to develop one base pair, which is the smallest unit that can be associated to a gene. Similar to developments that we've seen in previous examples, the cost of gene synthesis has decreased sharply, only about 25 cents per base pair that multiple companies right now can perform for basically any client. You might say that gene synthesis is a fluke, that it's a very isolated case. Well, this simply is reflective of a larger trend of decreasing costs. Let's look at another example, 3D bioprinting. 3D bioprinting is the, cap the capacity to manufacture organs and tissue artificially in a laboratory. And as cool as it sounds, it came with a very heavy price tag. In fact, in 2010, it would cost up to $200,000 to acquire a new 3D bioprinter. But in 2018, researchers at Carnegie Mellon University published a way in which you can build such a device for only 500 bucks. These three key sectors, an increase in medical data, increase in computational power and better artificial intelligence models, as well as diminishing costs in bioengineering, make this revolution in bioinformatics inevitable and very soon to come. You might wonder, well, how will a day look like in such a revolution? Gina comes home from a visit to her family doctor. She learns that she has been diagnosed with an incurable hereditary disease with no known cure. But Gina, she's not worried. She does not panic. She calmly types down her condition and some other details onto her laptop. She sends her information onto a global website, a website for bioinformatics. Moments later, on the other side of the world, Tommy sees a notification. 
he sees Gina's file, and by just clicking a couple of keystrokes onto his keypad, he's able to run some pretty advanced computer models that within minutes can generate some very impressive predictions of potential protein structures to use. Tommy then sends these results to an autonomous uh, manufacturing site where robots manufacture this new compound while running several simulations to ensure that this new compound is indeed safe for use. Once this is done, the result is then shipped to Gina. All this only took a matter of hours from Gina receiving her diagnosis to being cured of an incurable disease. As promising as this vision sounds, there are many questions that we have to ask. For instance, how can we ensure the safety of such predictions? How can we make sure that when a computer predicts a new compound, a new protein, that it's indeed safe to use? There are no easy answers to the question, but I believe that as there is an increase in computational power and in medical data, it is inevitable that we can create very accurate simulations of how macromolecules and proteins can interact in our human bodies, and therefore cutting years of costs in clinical trials and other experiments. But we might also wonder, well, who owns this data? I think it's very important that we make data as accessible as possible. As we may not be able to make all data open, we have to ensure that there is at least a part of data that is open sourced in order to ensure that innovation stems from the everyday person and not the select few. One other key factor to consider is biases in our data. It is a well-known fact that in recent years, when researchers are developing artificial intelligence models, that models can unintentionally pick up biases present in our data. We have to make sure that in this coming bioinformatics revolution, that we eliminate biases as much as possible. We need to ensure that we create models that are not generalized, but are rather reflective of human diversity. And to do this, we need to ensure that all communities and all minorities can participate in this upcoming revolution. I think there's one more question that many people here today are wondering. Well, where do we start? Which labs should I go to? Which top secret military bases should I infiltrate to get my hands on some cool genomic and protein folding things? Well, it turns out the lab that I need to go to looks like this. Your very own living rooms. I see some confused faces, <laughs> but it turns out that right now, at this very moment, when you get home, you can do a couple of internet searches and you can find instantaneously countless medical databases from the human genome to protein pathways to everything in between. You can also find various artificial intelligence toolkits, many of whom are run on the cloud and require no coding at all, as well as a, a high, highly diverse array of various machine learning tutorials. I believe that within days, anybody in this room right now can create some really awesome and really cool models that can be used in bioinformatics. While not every single person has a highly advanced 3D printer or some sort of gene synthesis device at home, it's entirely possible to reach out to corporations, to startups, and to uh, academic researchers to try to prototype these ideas. I think we're really living at a pivotal moment in human history because this current generation gets to decide how this bioinformatics revolution will play out. Is it a revolution in which only a few shareholders will decide which drugs to produce, which medication to release? Or will it be a revolution where truly the everyday person gets to contribute to innovation as we know it? To quote Emerson, do not take where the path may lead, but rather go where there is no path and leave your trail. I believe we're all trailblazers in this upcoming revolution because I believe that within our lifetimes, every single person in this room will be able to develop powerful computational models from the very comfort of your own living rooms, and that together, we can eradicate disease for the first time in human history. Thank you.